Hello everyone and welcome to the next ME 3313 lecture. Uh, we're going to be changing things up quite a bit and talking about cams for the next few lectures. So uh, I really like this material. I think you all will too and the past students have, have liked the, the cam stuff. That's just a good change of pace. We're you know probably all sick of hearing about four bars and slider cranks. So uh, something different, something interesting. Uh, so today uh, it'll be a pretty light lecture. We'll talk about terminology, a little bit about SVAJ diagrams, and some example applications for cams. So uh, two major kinds of joint rolling and translating. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is going to be for automotive cams. You know, when you hear the word cam, you probably think of automotive applications first. At least most of you would, I, I'm guessing. So. Uh, if you look at something like this, this is a, an overhead cam setup. So we have a cam that's going to be timed to rotate with the crankshaft. Uh, the cam for a four-stroke engine is going to be rotating half as fast as the crankshaft. Um, that's because uh, each valve is going to open and close every two revolutions of the crankshaft. So you need it to be rotating half as fast. Uh, so the cam is going to rotate. In this case, we have a cam that is impinging on a roller. Uh, so it's rolling contact. So uh, these things, when they're in contact, this is going to be rolling this way, this one's going to be rolling this way, and there's not a lot of friction at the actual interface between the cam and the, the roller here. So that would be rolling contact. Uh, and then this is on a little arm that's going to have a fixed pivot. I say fixed, it's going to be, you can kind of treat it as fixed. So you can say that the rocker's pivoting about that point, uh, cam's going to rotate, push on this roller, and it's going to rock this thing, which is called a rocker or a follower, down, uh, and that's going to push the valve open. That's going to let air into your engine or let air out of your engine, depending on which, if it's the intake or exhaust valve and where it's at in the cycle. Uh, so uh, this thing I'll talk about here in a second, uh, but that would be rolling contact. Translating contact, this would be a, an overhead valve uh, or a cam and block engine. Uh, where the cam is somewhere in the engine block. It rotates. There's this follower, which is usually called the lifter in practice. Uh, follower is more generic. Lifter in this application is, would be what that would be called. Uh, cam rotates. Uh, in this case, it's a translating contact. So the cam is actually sliding past the surface of the follower. It's now rolling on it. Uh, cam rotates, pushes this thing up. This actually pushes on a thing called a push rod. Uh, and then this rocker will have a fixed revolute joint here and it will unsurprisingly rock and then push the valve down and there will be a little translating contact here as well. There's all sorts of different variations of these. I'll cover some of these later on. Uh, but just because this is cam and block doesn't mean it has to have translating contact. I could easily put a roller on this lifter and that would be also unsurprisingly a roller lifter. Uh, and that would make rolling contact. There's pros and cons uh, to each. There's mainly pros with the rollers. They're just more expensive and bigger. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but in general, the rolling joint is analogous to a four bar. Uh, the translating joint's analogous to a crank slider. Um, roller's gonna be more efficient in general, and it's gonna be more complicated. Uh, I mean, you can imagine there's, there's, with this, there's sliding friction. That's going to be a direct efficiency loss in the engine. Uh, there's going to be more wear, which means it's going to wear out sooner. Uh, roller's going to be better in most applications. It's just going to be more expensive and harder to package. Uh, so I said I'd talk about this later. This might be getting ahead of things, but uh, it's there, so I'll talk about it. So uh, lash. Uh, if you've ever, if you're into engines at all or rebuilt engines, you've heard of lash before. Uh, valve lash is the clearance between uh, this application between the rocker and the valve stem. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of room in there. Why? Uh, so this engine is going to get hot as it runs. Uh, the oil gets hot. Uh, all the components are going to get hot. Metal's going to swell when it gets hot. And if there's no clearance here as this thing gets hot, uh, what can end up happening is you can hang the valve open a little bit. So it heats up and it actually is going to keep the valve open and then it's not going to be able to compress the air or contain the power during the power stroke. And the engine's just not going to run very well at all. Uh, so you need a little bit of a gap in there, which is called lash, and it's something, I don't know, 20, 10 to 30 thousandths, maybe something like that, depending on the engine. Uh, so 
on an engine like this one where there's everything's a solid chunk of metal here there'll be some kind of way of adjusting lash and in this design there's a little screw right here it'll set screw with a lock uh, nut on it of some kind and you you tighten the little set screw and then lock down the lock nut uh, and you put a feeler gauge of whatever the thing like a 10,000 15,000 feeler gauge in there and you tighten the lash until you start to get drag on your feeler gauge and then you lock down the lock nut and that that's how you'd set lash uh, this goes out of spec as an engine runs and parts wear in the lash changes will be some spec that you're supposed to uh, you know, every so and so miles go through and adjust uh, people are generally too lazy uh, to do that kind of thing nowadays uh, and so what automakers have done is design systems that automatically adjust the lash and that's what this guy is this hydraulic lash adjuster uh, it's a little hydraulic cylinder and uh, hydraulic fluid in this case is actually your engine oil so it pumps engine oil in at you know whatever 60 psi plus or minus whatever your engine's running at and it expands the cylinder in this thing and that actually takes up the lash uh, so now there's no zero there's 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 no gap and these there's a gap in here when the when the cam is on the base circle on the back here or called so called the heel get kind of getting ahead on terminology but uh in this there's a gap when it's on this portion of the cam there's that that gap in there until the engine heats up and the gap closes in this there's no gap there's always a little bit of pressure a little bit of preload uh, but as the parts heat up uh, this thing will compress a little bit it's only 60 psi it's not going to be a lot of force uh, and that will will allow this this thing to tolerate heating and cooling and doesn't need to be adjusted the downside is there's a little extra friction on it um, another downside is if your cam forces are high enough it can actually compress and push oil back out of this thing and it uh, affects your uh, um, your your camshaft or what, what the movement of your actual valve is going to be affected by that that usually happens at higher rpm so um, anyway uh, so that that's sort of separate from the rolling or translating but it, it's an important thing it's here so I'll talk about it joint closure uh, we talked about form and force closure early on in class so form means the joints closed by geometry uh, force means it's closed by force An automotive application cams are usually closed by the valve spring uh, so it's a spring it's a force it's force closed there are some form closed applications like this Ducati set up here where I have a, a follower on this side and a follower on this side actually sorry follower on this side and a follower on this side uh, and uh, it's actually form closed so Ducati is pretty well the only company I know of that, that does form closed valve train uh, they don't get a huge advantage out of doing it the spring technology actually works works pretty well uh, sort of the limiting factor on the spring technology is uh, RPM when at some point in time the springs not going to be stiff enough to control the valve and keep keep these things in contact with each other uh, and if you spin fast you'll get what's called valve lofting where you'll actually throw the valve off the rocker uh, and then it comes crashing back in and can cause all sorts of bad wear and other issues um, and to combat that you need a stiffer spring and there's only so stiff you can make these springs before that just doesn't work uh, so you know for example is the old school formula one engines like old school I mean like 10 15 years ago the, the V8s and the V10s before that uh, that would spin I don't know 20,000 ish rpm uh, those are past the limit of a metal spring for that size of an engine and they would actually replace it's the same basic setup as really same basic setup as as this 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 is closer to this than any of these isn't exactly that uh, but they would replace the metal spring with a little gas piston and they'd use a nitrogen gas spr spring instead of an air spring or sorry a nitrogen gas spring instead of a metal spring uh, for that higher rpm but the basic layouts pretty well the same as, as these uh, again, very, there's some other kinds of form closed cams that I'll talk about, but in, in automotive applications, it's usually force closed. Uh, type of follower. Uh, so, in these things in general that write on the cams are the generic name for that is a follower. They're called different things. Uh, in overhead cam engines, they might be called buckets, like in motorcycle engines, where it's more like. Uh, Actually, there's not a good. I'll have a diagram of it at some point. But in motorcycle engines, they're usually called buckets. In like it cam and block engines, will be called lifters. But the generic name for them is follower. Uh, there's flat followers. There's mushroom followers, where this is more of a rounded face. Uh, there's roller followers. 
So flat followers are going to be smaller, so they'll be easier to package. They're going to be cheaper because they're simpler. Uh, downside is there's lots of sliding friction on these, and as a result, they need to be broken in very carefully. So when you first start an engine up that has a flat follower, uh, the cam and the follower have to wear into each other um, and if that's not done correctly, we're using usually a really, really high shear strength oil or something that uh, like uh, it's got a molybdenum in it. Molyb molybdenum forms little bitty platelets and those platelets act like wet leaves and help help these things slide through each other and make it real gentle during during the break-in until these, these two parts are sort of worn in and sanded in on each other and, and uh, are, are going to be happy to wear against each other for an extended period of time. Um, if that you don't use the right break-in oil or for whatever reasons they don't wear into each other right, you can actually sand off or smear off your cam profile and then your cam's ruined. Uh, so that they need to be broken in. They're kind of a pain. Uh, there's other downsides too for a flat follower. Uh, you can't have any kind of concavity whatsoever in your cam profile as this illustrates. If you have any concavity in your cam profile, uh, it's going to dig into the corner here and then bad things will happen. Uh, so you're limited into what cam profiles you can use. So why why would you ever want to use it? It's cheap and it's easy to package. So that that would be why. Uh, roller follower. It's more higher part count. It's bigger. It's more complicated. Uh, it's going to be more expensive. Uh, it's going to be more reliable though because you have rolling contact and no sliding. It's going to be more efficient because there's no sliding, uh, and you can run better cam profiles. So from a performance perspective, this is universally better than that. Uh, roller is better, it's just bigger and more expensive. And if you'll see in the highest end of, of like cam and block, especially valve trains, you'll see roller followers. The cam profiles look a lot different too. We'll talk about cam profiles later on. Uh, types of cam. Uh, there's radial cams, so follower motion is in the radial direction like an automotive cam shaft, the valve motion here or the lifter motion is radial. Uh, there's axial cams too, like the swash plate in a helicopter, where the motion of these links here is in the direction of rotation. Uh, and there's a barrel cams, which we'll have an example of later, that's an axial cam that's fairly common. Uh, so there's radial and then there's, there's axial cams. Uh, motion programs. So there's critical extreme position. Critical extreme position is where uh, I care more about the timing uh, so I want something to be in one position, I want it to be in another position, I want it to get from there to there, and then I want to get back to some original position, and I mainly care about the timing of these events, not so much how they're connected, as long as they're connected in a good way. Uh, I care more about the timing and the extremes of, you know, for an automotive example, I care about how long the valve's closed, how long the valve's open. Uh, I don't care a whole lot about how it gets from those positions, as long as it's well behaved. Uh, that would be critical extreme position where you care more about the timing in the extreme. So automotive exam cams would be a good example of that where you care about the valve opening the valve or the, how long the valves open, how long the valves close, the relative timing of these events and you want it just to be smooth in between but you don't care about the exact shape. Critical path is different. Uh, that's when you care about everything in between. So you've got some very specific profile that you want a lifter to follow, uh, and you're sort of limited in your cam design to that very specific profile. You see that a lot in industrial cams uh, for different manufacturing processes, like mechanically controlled machines, like mill, mechanically controlled mills and lathes will have cams that, that define the profile. If you think about like a duplicator lathe, uh, where you've got some like a baseball bat. Oh, I'm gonna draw draw a baseball bat. I'm gonna draw a terrible baseball bat here, so I'm not even gonna try to draw it because it's probably gonna look weird. Uh, but a duplicator cam, a duplicator lathe has a, a cam that's shaped like the part you're gonna machine, and then you run a tool over the cam profile, and it makes a duplicate of that. In that case, the 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 part you're trying to duplicate would be the uh, critical path motion cam. Uh, we're going to mainly talk about critical extreme position in this class. Critical path motion, you know the path, you wrap it in a circle and you make the cam. It's not, we're not really that hard to do. Uh, critical extreme position is a little more interesting. There's a little more theory and math on it. Uh, programs. So rise fall. So rise fall is when I want my follower to go up and I want it to come down and then I want it to repeat. That's rise fall. Rise fall dwell, I want it to go up, I want it to come down, and then I want it to stay down for a while. 
rise dwell fall dwell I want it to rise I want it to stay open I want it to fall I want it to, to stay closed here uh, and then there's all sorts of different combinations of, of these things like an automotive cam is usually a dwell rise dwell fall dwell for example so those are your, your programs uh, you represent this in an SVAJ diagram so S is position, velocity, acceleration, jerk. We talked about jerk in a previous lecture, but that's the derivative of acceleration with respect to time. So uh, this would be our SVAJ diagram where we have a, it's going to start with no lift. The follower is going to lift up to the maximum lift. Dang it, stop. It's going to stay at that, stop. It's going to stay at that maximum lift for a while. And then it's going to fall down here. It's going to stay down here. It's going to dwell. It's going to rise, dwell. Fall, dwell. So this would be a rise, dwell, fall, dwell, rise, dwell, fall, dwell program. Uh, this shows a few different kinds of functions for connecting the dots between the dwells. Uh, so again, I've talked about dwells. Dwell is just a stationary where the input's moving, the output's not moving. That's what a dwell means. So uh, you can see at the dwells, the velocity, acceleration, and jerk are all zero because it's at a constant position. Uh, velocity, acceleration, and jerk, the higher derivatives are all, are all zero. Uh, so there's a few different functions. We'll talk mainly in the next lecture about the different mathematical functions for connecting the dots here. Uh, cycloidal is a common one. Mod sine, mod trap are common. Simple harmonics not super common. It's got some issues, uh, so you don't you don't see it. Simple harmonic is just the offset circle. So if I take a circle and put a revolute joint up here and then put a follower on this thing, uh, that is a simple harmonic motion. And it turns out it's got issues. Uh, I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, in general, for these functions to be well behaved, we want position, velocity, acceleration to be continuous, and jerk to be finite. So if we look at these different functions here, you see that position's continuous for all of these. Discontinuous position would be like, you know, a, a cam profile that looks something like that. And it's obvious that that would be bad, trying to run that at speed and not tear itself to pieces. So position must be continuous, but the, the higher derivatives, velocity acceleration must be too. So you can see in this case, uh, for all these different mathematical functions, this is all continuous here. So that, that's fine. Acceleration, continuous, that's all good. Continuous, continuous, continuous. Not continuous, that's a problem. That's why simple harmonic is not a good cam profile. Uh, is if I have a dwell, so I go from the, the simple harmonic motion to a dwell, uh, I get a jump in acceleration, and it's going to cause wear, it's going to cause vibration, it's going to cause, cause issues. Uh, when I take the derivative of again, I get some discontinuities out here for all of these. Really, I get some discontinuities for these infinite jumps here in acceleration. Or sorry, for a jump in an infinitely small amount of time, I have to have an infinitely large amount of derivative there to do that. And I get these uh, in infinite spikes of jerk, and that, that, that's part of the problem on simple harmonic. So, in general, these must be continuous. This must be finite. If you've done that, it's a, it's a decent, not, maybe not great, but it's at least a decent cam profile. Uh, in these diagrams, the independent variable is going to be the angle of the cam, which will be related to time, usually by omega times t. And we'll give you the cam angle. Uh, we're going to assume it's going to be running at a constant angular velocity just to make our lives easy. Uh, and then again, our dependence will be S, V, A, and J. Uh, again, the sinusoidal or simple harmonic cam profile is the easiest kind of cam to make, and it's just an offset circle. So if you plot these functions, S, V, A, and J, for this full cycle instead of just for a rise of it, you get something like this. And you can see that position is nice and continuous. Velocity is nice and continuous. If we don't have any dwells, acceleration is actually nice and continuous as well, and jerk is as well. So if I don't have any dwells, this is perfectly fine. Where this becomes a problem is if I stick a dwell here, uh, there's this jump here. If I stick a dwell here, there's this jump here, and it, that acceleration becomes discontinuous, and it becomes an issue. So we'll talk about better cam functions in the next lecture. Uh, engines, and I'll, I'll go ahead and post links to this in the description uh, so you can watch these videos. So I'll go through and do that uh, so you'll be able to, you, you know, I would just pause it and watch the videos at each point would be the best thing to do. Uh, so 
Uh, four engines, there's a few different kinds of cam profiles that are com or, uh, cam uh, setups that are common. Uh, overhead valve is where there's one camshaft, there is a lifter, there's a push rod, there's a rocker, and then that opens the valve. Uh, that's pretty common. GM loves this uh, still. They use uh, the LS engines, use this to about the, the best anyone does it. Uh, they've ever been iterating on this since like the 50s with the small block Chevy and, and honestly they have got it figured out pretty well. Uh, one camshaft does all the work, it opens and closes all the intake and exhaust valves. Uh, it's called overhead valve because the valves are up overhead uh, as opposed to a flat head and a flat head engine which is really kind of goofy and pretty rare except in, in little industrial engines. I've got the piston, I've got a cylinder head that is relatively flat and then the valves are actually going to be over here and then there's a little combustion chamber on on top and so this would be a flat head because the cylinder heads actually just basically a flat chunk of metal with maybe a little bit of a combustion chamber in it it doesn't have any valves or anything like that in it uh, the the old flathead Ford engines were flatheads uh, they make some industrial engines like little lawnmower and uh, weed eater engines and things like that that are still flathead engines. Uh, they're, they're real simple. That, that's why. They're not good, but they're, they're simple. Sorry, old Ford flathead fans. From a thermodynamic perspective, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a good engine. The combustion chamber is terribly shaped, uh, and your gas has to flow in all sorts of interesting circular or crazy arcs to get from point A to B to C. So not great aerodynamically, not great performance-wise. They look kind of cool, uh, and it's a cool name, but they don't really work very well compared to modern designs. Uh, overhead valve, you can immediately see here, the gas flows in a much better, I mean, it's basically flowing straight into the valve and then goes straight out. Uh, it doesn't have to turn all sorts of corners, so aerodynamically it works, works a lot better. Uh, downside of this is there's a lot of mass that you're slinging around here, so you might have problems at higher RPM controlling all of this stuff because of all the mass. Or you're putting this push rod in compression and you could actually cause that thing to buckle. Uh, but a lot of mass to sling around. Overhead valve, uh, or sorry, overhead cam is when the cam is in the cylinder head uh, and it's going to either directly impinge on a rocker, or sorry, directly impinge on a follower like in this, or it might impinge on a rocker and then the rocker opens the valve. There's different variations of that. Uh, less valve train mass, uh, usually for a four cylinder engine or something with one bank, you'll have one cam. For an engine with two banks, like a V8 or a V6, you'll have two cams. Uh, not a lot of advantages over overhead valve. Uh, it, you may be theoretically a little bit better at higher RPM because there's less valve train mass. Uh, maybe you can get a little bit different geometry. So here you're sort of limited in your valve angle. Here you might have some more choices in valve angle. And that might be able to help things out aerodynamically. Uh, you can also do one cam with multiple rockers and splay your valves over. So if you wanted to do like uh, two intake valves and two exhaust valves. Now, why would you want to do that? It's all about area. If I take this cross section, cross section of a cylinder bore, I can get more area for my valves if I have more valves. If I have two, I am really limited into how big those can be, and I've got all this wasted space that I'm not using to get air into the engine. At lower RPM, it doesn't matter. At higher RPM, uh, I'm going to at some point in time be limited in how much air I can get in and out of an engine, and uh, more valve area is going to be, be better. So you're pretty limited here in the valves you can use. Now you can use some really goofy long rocker and have multiple valves or some big diesels that do that, uh, but it's pretty pretty rare, and then your valve train gets really heavy, and diesels don't spin that fast RPM-wise. You know, like a, like a, the diesels that are in like a three-quarter and one-ton truck, those things will max out somewhere in around 3,500-ish RPM. Uh, whereas, like the LS engine that GM puts in stuff you know, that uses this can go over 7,000 RPM in some cases. Uh, but 6,500 RPM is no problem. So in big diesels, you just don't care about the valve train. The valve train's not a limiting factor at all because of the mass. Because uh, the engines just don't spin that quick. Uh, you know, these can spin pretty high. Uh, you know, these can spin pretty high. Uh, really, the, the, if you really want to spin your engine as fast as possible and have as little valve train mass as possible, this is pretty good. Dual overhead cam where I have an independent exhaust and intake cam. Uh, this was one that doesn't have rockers. This is where the valve directly impinges on this thing here. And motorcycle engines, it's called a bucket, but it's still, still a follower. 
um, and pushes the valves open. This is about as low as you can get on valve train mass, and which is why in motorcycle engines that spin really high RPM, you know, these crazy 15, 16,000 RPM motorcycle engines, they look like this inside uh, usually because there's very, very little mass. And uh, when you're spinning at high speed, you want as little mass slinging around as possible. You see dual overhead cam with rockers in it too. That, that's pretty common across all automakers. Uh, different variations of, of this. But in, in general, you know, lower mass, it's better for higher RPM. Uh, and the lowest you can go on mass is something like this. You know, this is, gets a little heavy, especially if you've got a big rocker that's pushing two valves. But if you don't need to spin fast, that, that's fine. You know, diesels can make a lot of power at low RPM because they've got massive turbochargers and they've got, there's some limitations that, that gas engines have that diesels don't have when it comes to uh, how much air and fuel you can cram into a cylinder before bad things start to happen. We'll talk more when we get into engines on that. Uh, some terminology on engine cams. Uh, base circle is sort of the minimum radius here uh, where it spends most of its time on the base circle. Uh, this is going to form the heel down here where the base circle is at. The nose is out here where we actually are going to do some lift. Uh, the flank is the main meat of the lift portion here. Uh, and it looks flat and it, it, it totally depends on what, what profile. For a flat uh, for a flat follower, you might have a cam that actually looks kind of flat here. Uh, for a roller follower, it's not going to look like this at all. It's going to look more kidney bean shaped in some cases. Lift is going to be the max distance between the base circle and this, this at the nose here. Uh, that's going to be the max amount the lifter is lifted up. Uh, clearance ramp, so when we, for engines that have some lash, uh, you need a little, very carefully designed profile here to take that lash up so it doesn't slam into the flank. Uh, when the lash gets closed up. Again, that depends on engines. If you've got hydraulic followers, then you don't really need much of a clearance ramp. If you've got solid followers, uh, you, you need some kind of a clearance ramp. And if you have too much lash, you're going to get extra wear because the, it's going to slam into the flank when it hits the follower. Uh, engine cam profiles. Here's an example of uh, some different, uh, so a stock cam profile and then some hot rodded cam profiles from the, this company here. Uh, for automotive applications, this diagram is going to be 720 degrees wide. Uh, in this case, they've done 360 times two, uh, but really, it's 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 going to be 720 degrees for of a rotation for the crank. And then you'll have the exhaust opening and closing, the intake opening and closing, and you'll have a little bit of what's called overlap between those when both valves are open a little bit. Uh, that's done primarily for aerodynamic reasons and just an engine speed. It takes time. Your all your flows all have inertia, and um, you might need to start getting air out of a cylinder before, while you're getting air into it, and it, it works because the air flows have inertia, and um, and it's not like the air is going to go straight out the intake and in, straight at, through the intake and out the exhaust, uh, and it's not like uh, having the piston going up during the intake stroke. Uh, it's not like that's going to push air out the intake because the, the inertia of the air going into the intake valve uh, can keeps it going into the cylinder even though the piston might still be going up. Um, again, th this is this is a lot about engines in particular that's outside of the scope of this class. Uh, so if you're interested in this kind of stuff, take the internal combustion engines class we offer. Uh, it goes into a lot lot more depth on on this this kind of stuff. Uh, so let's talk about some non-automotive applications. An interesting example is uh, bows. Uh, this is a great, great uh, plot here uh, where we've got force, pull force versus draw distance. So if you think about it like a long bow, which a long bow, uh, you know, we're essentially talking about a piece of wood that we put a string on it. Uh, it's almost a linear spring. So this, this is almost linear. So when I double the draw distance, I have double the force. And if I think about trying to pull one of these things back and aim it, uh, when I've got it pulled all the way back and the energy stored in it, that's at its peak force. And I'm having to sit there and hold 250 newtons uh, or even more uh, for, for like an old English longbow where the pull might be 200 pounds. Uh, you're sitting there holding 200 pounds while you're trying to aim this thing. And it's incredibly difficult to do. Uh, it took a lot of training, a lot of practice, a lot of building building strength and muscle memory in order to do that. Uh, recurve bows, uh, 
have a little bit of a dual spring rate so they get to some point where the graft has a knee and the spring rate drops off a bit and it's a little easier to hold but not a lot. Uh, compound bows with these cams do all sorts of fun stuff. You can actually make this graph look about like anything you want. You can make it linear if you wanted to, but what you really want to do with this is make it so when you pull this thing back, you still have so that the area under this curve is going to be energy, right? Force times distance, that's going to be energy. So the area under this curve is the energy stored in uh, the, the limbs of the bow that gets transmitted you know, at least by some efficiency into the arrow itself. So the area under this curve is the energy. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to get the same energy as these other kinds of bows, but when you've got the thing pulled all the way back and you're trying to hold and precisely aim this thing, you're not sitting there holding a couple, you know, 175 pounds, whatever the max peak is. You're not sitting there holding that while you're trying to aim. And if you also think about your arms as you pull a bow back, there's different mechanical advantage. There's different transmission ratios. We talked about that. Uh, there's going to be a period of draw where you're, you're strong and you can actually support high forces, but then when you're holding it all the way back somewhere around your ear before you let it go, uh, you're, you're not very strong. Uh, so with the cams, you can store lots of energy and have this peak somewhere where you've got good mechanical advantage in your arms, but then it drops off. And so when you're holding it all the way back near your ear before you let go, uh, this force is relatively low. Uh, and you can make it really low. You could make it so this is like down here at you know one percent of the max there were some experimental bows they did a while back that were like 98 percent let off uh, and so this would drop down to about two percent of the maximum force for so for like a like a hundred pound bow which would be pretty ridiculously high but a hundred pound bow you'd only be holding two pounds of force back by your ear which is which is nothing uh, and then you'd, you'd let it go and then it rapidly this force would would go back into the arrow and the arrow would would accelerate initially very slowly then accelerate really really rapidly and then uh, would, the acceleration would drop off and the arrow would actually release from the string at some point uh, but the point is with cams you can make it do whatever you want it's a hugely flexible so uh, you can store more energy you can make it more comfortable and more you can aim these things more precisely and I've done a little bit of, of, of bow hunting before and I don't say bow yeah, you don't fire a bow, you shoot a bow. I don't know what you call it. People, bow hunters have their own terminology on it. But uh, I can say that a modern bow is in incredibly accurate. What you can do with, with a you know simple wall mechanical widget like this is, is incredible. And it's because you don't, you don't have to sit there and hold 75 pounds back by your ear and try to aim this thing. You might be holding 10 or 15 pounds, which you can hold comfortably uh, for a long time without stressing. And you can actually aim these things and be, be incredibly accurate with them. Uh, whereas an old longbow, it's very hard to be as accurate with them. And, and honestly, it's hard to get as much energy stored in them as a good recurve bow where you can be storing lots of energy over here, uh, you know, have a broader, flatter profile. You can store more energy and it's more comfortable. Uh, so it's sort of the best of all worlds. It's just more complicated. And, you know, honestly, compared to stuff we make nowadays, this isn't that complicated of a thing. So um, it's sort of one of those things that's universally better. Uh, you know, people... There's people, some people out there that are snobby about bows and talk about, you know, wheelie bows and compound bows being cheap. They're universally better. It's a better solution. So you're crazy to use anything but a compound bow. You know, the people that use long bow and recurve bows, they're, they're just doing it because they can. It's not because it's better in any way, other than that's cheaper. Uh, cams for transmission shifting. So this is a barrel cam or an axial cam. Uh, here, uh, I've got these little forks is what these things are called and as this cam rotates there's these little pegs that are force sorry form uh, form closed here uh, so as this cam rotates about its axis uh, these forks move axially since so hence it being an axial cam uh, and in this case I've got three forks this is from a, looks like a motorcycle or an ATV something like that so probably somewhere around six speeds probably doesn't have reverse maybe it does I can't tell on this one I could look at it closer and probably figure it out but I don't care that much uh, but in this case as I rotate this it's going to move these forks up and down and it's going to select which gears are engaged onto the shafts uh, and that determines the different ratios um, we'll talk more about that when we get into gears uh, but this is pretty common in motorcycles, sequential manual transmissions, uh, ATVs, things like that. Uh, not real common in cars until you get into race cars. Race cars, this is a thing. Uh, but uh, motorcycles, if you if you ever rode a motorcycle that's got like a five or six speed transmission or something like that, it's probably going to be shifted like this. There'll be a barrel cam 
somewhere in it. Uh, feeder D linker. Uh, so this is in a minigun uh, or any kind of Gatling gun, really. Uh, you can see there's this, this profile here in the housing. That's actually a cam. There's a little bearing that rides on bolts, and there's going to be one bolt for each chamber. And that's what actually causes the bolts to open and close. So it can um, load a cartridge in, fire, and then get the cartridge out. That's all done with a cam. Uh, likewise, there's going to be a belt coming into this thing that's going to be holding the cartridges. And there's going to be a cam here that's going to actually strip the cartridges off the belt uh, so they can be fed into the, the chamber on the actual the barrels up here. Uh, so there's lots of interesting videos of that on the internet. I'll link, link one in the description. Uh, but that's a kind of cam cam profile too. Uh, so before digital electric computers and analog electric computers existed, uh, if you wanted to do some kind of a mathematical computation automatically, you would make a cam. Uh, you can make a cam, grind it to a mathematical uh, shape or a, some kind of a math profile. Uh, it's a function generation mechanism and you can spin a crank and get some kind of a mathematical function out of the cam. Uh, so they would make entire giant mechanical computers for calculating the trajectory for things like artillery shells. Uh, that was a real common thing World War I through the early part of World War II. I guess through World War II. The ba big battleships had mechanical computers in them. Uh, that you basically there'd be like an electric motor that'd be turning the shafts on this thing but most of the work was actually done by gears and differentials and cams and you could do mathematical integration differentiation multiplication subtraction division you could do some nonlinear stuff with cams a really pretty interesting completely obsolete there's no reason you'd ever want to do this again incredibly complicated to make these things uh, they're really neat i highly recommend if you get a chance there's uh, here in the u.s we preserve several world war ii era battleships uh, and they've got the mechanical computers and they're just really, really interesting, fascinating things that make no sense in the modern era whatsoever. Uh, this is one element of that. This is a ball and disk integrator uh, that actually performs integration. Like if you're computing a trajectory uh, for a shell, you need to integrate it because uh, it's not just a simple parabolic motion like you cover in physics. Uh, when you start factoring in like aerodynamic drag and these other factors and the, the rate of change of the thing you're trying to shoot at it's a it's a integration problem and so they actually made mechanisms that perform mathematical integration uh, sewing machines um, before the modern era of uh, stepper controlled digital sewing machines uh, you'd have different cams for different stitches and so you put a cam in and you get a different different stitch out uh, cryptography again. Any, anything where you need a mathematical equation you can grind a cam to that profile so I'll link a video for how cams are ground here uh, you know, most of them are going to be ground to shape you know these like these would be cast into shape or injection molded into shape but your automotive cam profiles and things shapes like this will be, be ground into shape like these these channels in here get those are actually pretty tricky to machine Likewise, I don't honestly know how they machine these. They probably cast them to shape very precisely, and then I honestly have no clue how they get in there and machine those. That would probably be interesting to see. It's probably pretty proprietary, too. Uh, you know, automotive cam, these cams are just machined out of aluminum. That's not that big of a deal. Automotive cam profiles have to be very precise and made out of very hard materials, uh, so those are going to be, be, be ground. So lots of different applications for cams. Uh, so that's it for today's lecture. Next time we'll get into uh, more on the math of the cam rise and fall functions, uh, more on how to design a critical extreme position cam. Uh, and the lecture after that, we'll talk about sizing cam lobes. So uh, that's it for today, and I will see you all later.